Good evening, and thanks for joining us for our CIF 45 streams, opening night Q&A. I'm Mallory Martin, the Artistic Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival. We want to give special thanks to Dollar Bank, who is sponsoring opening night, and thanks to Ginny and John Johnson for sponsoring our CIF trailer once again this year. I'd also like to introduce Karen Schiller from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting for us tonight. Thank you for being here, Karen. If you just finished watching our opening night film together together through the CIF Streams app on your TV, you will be able to continue watching our Q&A session on that platform. However, if you do want to submit a question for the Q&A, you won't be able to do that through the app, unfortunately. So you'll need to switch to your computer, laptop, tablet, or smartphone and log in using your same ticket link that you use to watch the film in order to submit a question. Otherwise, you can stay right on your same device and just watch if you don't want to engage. So without further ado, I'm honored to introduce Nicole Beckwith, the director and writer of Together Together. Hi, Nicole. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi, hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh, so let's get started. I have some questions to ask you at the beginning and then we'll start taking questions from the audience in a little bit too. Um, I wanna kick it off by just thanking you, Nicole, for writing and making such a refreshing, beautiful film. Um, I'm sure you've heard this a lot by now, uh, but it really is remarkable, I think, especially as a programmer, to find a film like this uh, that crushes all preconceptions, yet it's still warm and funny and makes you love movies all over again. So I just wanted to start off by thanking you. <laughs> so now I'm just gonna cry for the whole thing. <laughs> Um, thank you for saying that. It's so it's so hard to take to uh, take in the um, enormity of the emotional uh, space that holds. But thank you. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Oh, I promise not to try to make you cry too much. There. <laughs> uh, but I'm actually going to steal your thunder here a little bit because um, I want to say that when I watched your film intro q and A, I I think it was like at Sundance, yes, a little bit that you did before the film even started, long before I knew that we'd be playing it at SIF. I wrote down something that you said because I loved it so much. You said that you wanted to write something that was a divergence from forever being an ingredient to happily ever after. And if you were gonna say that, I apologize because they just stole it from you. Um, but it really made me just fall in love with your movie before I even watched it. And I just, I wrote it down in my phone after you said it. And I was like, if we get to share this film with our audience, I, I, I wanna share that with them for sure because I just thought that was so beautiful and so, so fresh. Um, so I'd really like to hear first about the script, um, which is where it all starts, right? So this is your second feature that you wrote and directed after Stockholm, Pennsylvania. Um, when did you start writing this one? And what was the writing process like for you? Where, where did the idea come from? Um, I've been carrying the idea around for a while the way you do with ideas or something, you know, it just kind of like pops in and then you, car you carry it around for a while and whatever sticks, sticks after, I mean, Gosh, I had maybe been like loosely thinking about it for a couple of years in the back of my mind. And um, after Stockholm, Pennsylvania was at Sundance, I got um, like a call from the San Francisco Film Society and they were doing like a female screenwriter genre um, fellowship <clears throat> and invited me to apply. And everyone I think kind of thought I was going to apply for the like horror um, because genre because Stockholm, Pennsylvania mm. was so uh, psychological um, and tense. And um, instead I, I was like, oh, I have like a comedy kicking around. <laughs> Though it's not like it's like, a, I mean, I think when we s hear comedy, we think like bridesmaids or something, which is like right. <laughs> very funny. But um, uh, so then I applied with the, the idea. I kind of like wrote out a, a like a pitch and the, the fellowship was, they would like give us a stipend. There were three of us, horror, comedy, and um, sci-fi. And mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so I, I wrote the, the film on that fellowship. So that was cool. Um, and especially cool because the film lent itself to being set in San Francisco um, with the like technology app. Um, 
tilt and then also they have really california has excellent surrogacy laws so that was also very accessible and really nice and then i got that fellowship so like i actually did think of a lot of the film like walking around the streets of san francisco and so like it was mm -hmm. a nice um kismet yeah so how long did it take you to write it in total Oh geez, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's like I, I have no idea. I think um, I was talking about this earlier today. I'm glad you quoted me to try to prevent me from me quoting me because I feel like doing all these Q and A's in press. I'm just like quoting myself all the time, which feels weird. But um, <laughs> uh, my my writing process is a little strange. I've come to learn through people's reactions to it. Um, when I'm writing a feature, I didn't study writing and I didn't go to film school. And um, I found that uh, I just sit and write. Um, I write and write and write. I will write hundreds of pages of stuff that um, isn't going to go into anything just to kind of get to know the characters. So I know some writers um, kind of have the experience of being like, god of the universe or whatever like the i, I don't want to say puppet master because that feels like very <laughs> controlling and, and it feels almost <laughs> like i'm accusing other writers of something but um kind of like you know you're making things happen mm -hmm. but i feel quite the opposite i feel like i'm i'm like observing and just like taking notes like i, I feel like a stenographer almost um yeah. in like a courtroom and so i'll write just so many pages of like innocuous conversations to get to know the characters. And then as they become, as I become more acquainted with them, they reveal more intimate things to me. And it really is kind of like building a relationship with, an, with anyone. Um, and so I'll write a lot, a lot of pages and then I'll feel like, oh, okay, I'm ready to like move forward um deeper into like more intimate stuff and so i'll like start a new document and just write a bunch mm -hmm. of conversations a bunch of pages and then i i do that for a long time i uh i don't like fear the blank page um but it is like sometimes daunting but and then eventually like um the story reveals itself to me through the characters um mm -hmm. and then i'll start the blank script that like where I'm like okay now I know I'm also writing the story and I don't look back over what I've already written because I feel like if it sticks it sticks and it was mm. meant to be in there um and then I'll write and then so because of that like when I write my my first draft actually of the screenplay it's very similar to the final draft of the screenplay mm. because I've already done so much just like wandering around in the, the world of, in this case, like Matt and Anna. Yeah, that's fascinating that you say that too, because I think it's reflective in the in the outcome of the film in some ways too, because I think it is very character driven. And I, I feel like, I almost feel like, like that's kind of how I, as a viewer, that's how I watched the film too, is I just learned mm -hmm. to get to know them before even learning their story in a way. So I love that. I love that that's a writing process. That's great. <laughs> it also sounds maddening, like to have to write that many pages too, I think, but I, I think- It's kind of nice. It's nice. Yeah. It's like, I mean, especially in, um, you know, quarantine, it's like, right. let, me blast, let me blast out of here. And like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just recently wrote a scene for something else that's like, literally 15 pages just of a family in an olive garden parking lot trying to figure <laughs> out like who's taking whose car and it's like obviously that, like, won't like end up in, in its entirety in the script but i just am like really enjoying being in the parking lot with the family being like yeah, anyway so it's it's <laughs> um, it's very yeah it's nice yeah <laughs> um, well cool. and i think i think also um you know there's no denying that um, romantic love is, is very is a constant focus in our society, and I, I've heard you say before that that was um, something you wanted to avoid uh, in this film for sure. So, I think your attention paid to platonic love um, is again not only refreshing but like so welcome, and especially at a time when I think we're all really craving more human connection, really in in any form. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about? what it's like releasing this film at, at this period in time. Do you have any specific hopes for the release? Um, 
I hope everyone is safe when they like yeah. drown into the world. Um, it's we we shot the film in 2019, and so I was in the editing room um, through most of the edit when we went into quarantine, um, and then did color and sound remotely um, for the most part. And um, I felt very lucky to have the film to keep me company because I I do think um, it's a very kind film and um, I wasn't even necessarily like aware of that un until it was my main squeeze like I, that like that's who I was hanging out with was the movie um, <laughs> and I was like very relieved that um, that it was a place that you wanted to be for for hours and hours on end and it was also funny to live quarantine where we were all kind of in Groundhog Day and then on top of that, I was watching the same scenes over and over and over and over again. Um, ultra like Groundhog Day squared. But yeah, so I was very, um, I was grateful for the film to keep me company then. And and similarly, like when we were at Sundance and digital and all still very locked down and um, like vaccines were like, whispering about but we still weren't necessarily like we didn't have this uh like biden timeline in place right. kind of so um it was nice again to be able to share the film in the echo chamber of quarantine in that way and then um now i mean we release april 23rd and it's like for a lot of people i think it'll be their first movie they see in a movie theater which mm -hmm. is so um crazy and it's also just like funny like the name of the movie like just being like the whole idea of being together so it's really <laughs> it's uh it it feels like strangely um appropriate kind of um and then you know the film is an intimate film it is like largely two people talking and so i also felt like in quarantine when i was like even watching seinfeld or something or like succession, I'd be like, what are you all having dinner together for? Get away <laughs> from each other. There's too many people at a dinner table. And then I'd be like, right, right, right. No, no. There's a different time, Nicole, there's a different time. And so um, what was nice that even though this film was written and um, filmed before quarantine is that it still had an, an intimacy and like, um, I was comfortable with how many people, with the exception of the baby shower, how many people were around each other, <laughs> right. you know? And so I was like, okay, that's all right. And it's slowly. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny that, that you say that too, because I, I feel like this whole last year of watching films as well, I'd find myself being like, why are you outside without a mask on? Like, why are the characters not wearing masks? And how that just it's crazy. sticks into your, your psyche. It's funny. Yeah. Um, okay, so besides platonic love, um, another theme that's almost never told within mainstream media is the idea of the male biological clock, right? And if you do see these stories, especially ones involving surrogacy, it's typically the gay couple wanting a baby, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about writing Matt as a single cisgender straight male. Did you always see him that way? Um, yes. Um, I think, uh, I think like, yes, we're very used to seeing men like being dragged into like fatherhood, either by like a wife that's like, my biological clock is crazy, or like accidentally stumbling into it and it's something they have to like handle or adjust to. Um, and so I think like part of, and then we also have this like very detrimental view of like women being like ruled by their biological clock, being like their identities being like completely usurped through pregnancy or motherhood or whatever. Um, and so I also like, I think I strongly uh, identify with this idea that like, uh, if you're gonna change the representation of women and deepen, that representation you have to do the same <laughs> with men like mm -hmm. feminism is for everybody and um and feminism helps men and this is one of the ways you know it's like we need to there men want to be dads too and they do have biological clocks and um and i think it's like it's similar to the thing of like a mom drops off and picks up a kid at school every single day of the year except for one the dad comes in picks him up and then everyone's like what an amazing dad 
Oh my God. Did you see that? He picked up his kid from school. And it's like, that's also really harmful. It's harmful for women. It's harmful for men. It's harmful. And so I, I did really want to tell a story about the like, yeah, male biological clock. And we are very used to the idea of like women doing whatever it takes unconventional or otherwise to become mothers against all odds. But we don't talk about that in men. And it's like, they want to be dads. Um, and so, yeah, it was funny, like when I was first sharing the script with um, like people with power and money or whatever, sometimes they would be like, so what is Matt gonna do with the baby? And I was like, what do you mean? He's gonna like love it and care for it and raise it for the rest of his life. And they're like, uh, but like, that's it. And it's just like, okay, well, this story really <laughs> needs to be told. It's like, you're thinking like, well, yes, after the credits roll, Matt sells the baby. Like that's, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, and it's just like, we're conditioned to not associate um, men with caretaking roles and conditioned to associate women with them, which is another reason why I think surrogacy is often portrayed uh, like in a melancholy fraught light um like it's this idea that like a woman is giving something up it's a it's a, the baby's being taken from her um and of course like you don't know what you're getting into once you're pregnant it eclipses all other you know uh aspects of your identity and personality and it was like well that's not fair either um mm -hmm. so like at surrogacy is is um additive i think like it's often portrayed as something that's negative or sacrificial but it's like it's additive here's a person that didn't exist like here's a baby that i'm that's added to the world here's a family created um where it's po it's positive as well like there's a whole part of that and and i think it's still very stigmatized um and i think part of that must be runoff from you know, mainstream or like popular cultural depiction of surrogacy stories as being fraught. And I understand it, how delicious the drama, like it's like, I get it. And, it, and, and I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but I think like you have to shine a light on the other, on the other end of things, especially as it's becoming more and more a part of the way families are made. Right. Yeah, and thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, okay, so let's talk about casting. Um, I'm yeah. dying to know the stories of how you casted both Ed Helms and Patty Harrison. And so for those of you who don't know much about Patty, um, she's pretty incredible. And there's also a totally different side of her than, <laughs> than what you captured in the film. And I- Buckle and I up, that. everyone. <laughs> yeah. Buckle up. Yeah. So, and you, so again, for those of you who don't, know much about patty um you can find her in shows like shrill and broad city uh which i love and, and she's actually from a small town in ohio originally and went to my alma mater ohio university which is pretty cool um but but anyways i i, I love that you provided this platform for, for both of your leads to play characters that you might not have been um or that we might not have been immediately um expecting them to play necessarily so can you talk about how you casted both ed and patty Yes, I mean, ultimately, it's like very boring. It's like they read it and they liked it. The end. Um, <laughs> and like I love them and I love them and the end. But um, yeah, so we sent to Ed first, um, and then I got like Anthony Brandonicio, who's my producing partner in the film, who also worked with me on my first film. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, "Well, we sent the script to Ed, and Ed likes it and wants to meet." And I was like, "What?" Um, okay, I was like, I guess, like he like really does, like okay. And so we went and had coffee, and um, you know, I'm a huge Ed fan. I'm a I'm a millennial, which means I watch The Office like it's my job. Right. You hear my cat? I'm sorry. I can't tell if my cat is stuck. I apologize. It's okay. We'll find out sooner or later if he's stuck. Um. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, when I watch, um, like the office is the Andy Bernard is the role of Ed's that I'm most familiar with because it's something that you watch over and over. And um, and yes, he's hilarious and kind of slightly absurdist. And there's like a lot of like what people have come to identify as like Ed Hel like very Ed Helms, like that right. character. It's like a, 
a stamp. And then, but when I, when I watch it, especially when you're on the like seventh watch or eighth watch or whatever, I'm just thinking to myself, oh, there is a man who is struggling to feel at home in his own family. There is a man who wants his father's approval. Mm -hmm. Um, Here is someone who is, who went, was accepted to Cornell. (laughs) However, (laughs) a nepotism played into that. But that nepotism also made him feel more connected to Cornell because he doesn't feel connected to his family. And then like, that's all about his potential. But now here he is moving into this part of his life where you can't live off potential and it's, and he's struggling and there's so much humanity and vulnerability in there. And, um, and I, I cry with Andy all the time. And, and I was just, you know, Ed has this magic power of imbuing such raw, beautiful, vulnerable humanity to any part no matter how big the swings on screen are, it's all really rooted. And so I was really drawn to this idea of like, well, what if we take that and put that in the front seat and the other mm-hmm. stuff in the back seat? And um, and he did it so beautifully. I mean, I love Matt. I really, I love Matt so much. <laughs> and, um, and working with Ed was wonderful. And our first conversations about this were wonderful. And I also um, so appreciated, like, I, I really was appreciative that, um, you know, he's done big fancy projects and he, and he works a lot and he's, I mean, he's at home and, right. um, and then here I was, I was like, Oh, hi, I made another, one other movie. And <laughs> it was also like a psychological drama and like drastically different in tone than the movie you just read of mine, but I'm going to re- to make this movie too. And he was just like, yes, like he, we watched the first movie I assume and and could see that I knew how to make a movie and then read the mm-hmm. script and could see you know it's just like I think sometimes when you are talking with people like a lot of people they can only go one to one it's like but that's so different from what you're doing or you know they just want right. someone to do the same thing all the time and Ed really isn't like that he just saw immediately you know we were just two brains two hearts having a, a conversation and um, really clicked and he was such a wonderful collaborator. Um, and so I think like 20 minutes into our first coffee, we were like, well, obviously we're doing this together. Like it was very easy. It was, it was insanely easy. Um, so that was awesome. glorious. And then um, with like the power of Ed, you know, then I was like, well, maybe we can, maybe we can take some, you know, swings with Anna. Cause I would really love, you know, to, um like I felt like in a way like not as extreme but it's kind of like here giving Ed this space to do something different and more grounded and more um, uh, like emotionally like raw and available was great and then I was like and what if we also get to like gift people with like this other unexpected performance from a an actor that they they might not know as well as you right. know someone who's like just beginning um and that just is like a treasure and i had um you know i i think i was in a writer's room at the time working in a writer's room and i had been talking about like i'm trying to find my anna or whatever um and someone's i think mentioned patty's name like oh do you know patty harrison so i googled thank you internet and saw her um tonight show appearance which was like this Mm -hmm. iconic tonight show appearance and as soon as I saw the Tonight Show appearance, I was like, oh yeah, there's Anna. And so then watched High Maintenance and watched um, A Simple Favor. She has a very funny scene in A Simple Favor. And um, and like, it's only a funny scene because she makes it something so great. You know what I mean? Like it, it, anybody else in that scene, it just would have been like yeah. a scene, but like Patty makes it shine. It's like, she's she's so talented. And so, yeah. Um, and then Shrill was coming out, so I watched Shrill, and Patty is this beautiful, like, there is um, a magnetism and, a like, a lean-in, like, you want, she has that movie star thing, mm-hmm. you know, you want to be watching, but she also has this, like, kind of sly saltiness that's, like, but not too far, and that's exactly <laughs> what um, Anna needs, you know, that is Anna, and um, and I don't think that that's something that you can necessarily like as a director, like give as a direction. 
Um, hmm. Like be really open, but also kind of close. Like it's an impossible thing to communicate unless it's intrinsically like already in the orbit of what's happening hmm. to that person. So it was like, um, so I watched those things and I, I listened to podcasts and watched interviews because um, I like to watch interviews with people <clears throat> as much as I like to watch their other work because I think like you get a feel for them a little bit like that's the toolbox or whatever like that's what's kicking around ready to be right. summoned summoned up and reshaped and so um and then we sent the script to Patty and we went and had coffee and it was like a very um a, a really easy click and she's very thoughtful and wonderful and so funny and um and it was exciting to think because like you know it was a different genre for me in in film or like a different tone um and so it was like we were kind of adventuring on this shift together like she'd never delivered an earnest performance she said and mm -hmm. she'd never been cast in like a vulnerable you know just like a a non-performative role and mm -hmm. um and that is terrifying i mean it's terrifying and to her credit she was like okay let's go and um and we really kind of like you know it was we held hands the whole time it was like we were just right i mean it's very funny like <laughs> when you're watching together together <laughs> know that i am just out of frame like i'm a very <laughs> i don't sit in a chair i don't go to video village like i'm like right there like there are scenes where i'm literally lying on the ground right next to where she is just being like <laughs> and because it's like a this private thing so we're like very close physically and emotionally and yeah. you do have to create a a rapport right um we shot the bulk of the film in 17 days in Los Angeles and then went oh. to San Francisco for a day and a half of exteriors. And so same is true for Ed, you need a, a shorthand really quickly and like a, a level, like an emotional foundation and an understanding to be able to make a movie in that limited amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to be, um, you can't force intimacy and you can't force knowing each other, um, but you can be open to it. You can just be like, everything's open over here. So like, mm -hmm. we all have a VIP pass to like move around and reveal things about ourselves and each other and just like have this space where you can make something emotional. And they were both um, really game for that. And, I, and it shows, I think that, um, yeah, we had a really wonderful experience together. To speak for them, they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I imagine that they did very much. I, I think that well, even just in the film, and I, I love what you said about Patty because you're totally right. She she does have a magnetism to her, and I remember the first time I I saw her in something, I was like, "Whoa, who is that?" You know. So yeah. I think that was perfect casting. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience too. So I'm going to turn to some of those. Um, so Aaron, first of all, says, I don't think I've seen a film that examines platonic love with such wit and empathy since when Harry met Sally, although that film ends differently. Uh, did you have any films that you looked to for inspiration, even if it was just for conventions or scenes you wanted to subvert? It's a great question. Um, when Harry met Sally is a wonderful reference, um, even though it does end differently. I remember yeah. my mom, I mean, this is a tangent, but my mom was like, men and women can't be friends. <laughs> Let me prove it to you. And she made me watch When Harry Met Sally because I had a bunch of friends that were guys and she was like, none of them are friends with you. We're going to watch the movie. But I do really love that movie. Um, and uh, Nora Ephron, I mean, Nora Ephron is someone, uh, movies that we looked to, um, mm -hmm. even though she is telling stories of romantic love, there is like a a warmth and a kindness to her to her movies, and uh, we we wanted the film to feel both um, new and like of the now, but also kind of um, not necessarily nostalgic, but timeless in mm -hmm. the merging of nostalgia and nowness, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, Nora Ephron was definitely. Um, I mean, what a genius! Um, so those films we looked to, and um, even that's reflected in the score. Like 
um, those scores are standard piano. And so I knew I wanted a piano score um, because of that, but also wanted to make it, didn't want to do standards, wanted to make it new. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, funnily in answering, in asking that question, they also answered it. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, I don't want to talk about Woody Allen, but obviously like there's a little bit of, of, of that in there. Um, and you know, cause he, he ruined everything. And I just <laughs> I wanted to be like, no, this can happen, but a movie can be kind and not gross. Um, and so just those types of, those types of like 70s, 80s, 90s, um, two-handers basically, or, you know, yeah. So that's what. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, we also have a question from Beth. Uh, Anna was so intuitive and wise beyond her years, mainly due to teaching us older folks wisdoms. Where did you find her knowledge, research, um, i.e. interviewing versus personal experience, and why don't I know as much? Interesting. Hmm. So I think, so she's saying, where did you, and I think in the writing of Anna is what she's asking, is, is how... Oh. Um, <laughs> well, I'm right here to be so so wise beyond I'm, your years, I think. Because I'm wise beyond <laughs> my years. No, um, <laughs> I think um, uh, I think so. Like Anna's story, I don't want to say backstory, but the the parts of Anna's life that we don't see on camera, where she had this um, mm. teenage pregnancy and. Um, and I wrote a lot, like for both um, Ed and Patty, I wrote like long essays or whatever about the life of Matt up until the moment the movie starts and Anna up until the moment the movie starts. And I did do a lot of research actually um, on what that experience of teenage pregnancy would have been for her in the state that I imagine she was from. And, um, you know, I picked her town and I figured out the mileage between Planned Parenthoods and all of the stuff. And then, um, so in the things that's not in the film, Anna was pregnant and wanted to have an abortion in that state. Her family would have had her, a parent or guardian would have had to co-sign for that abortion. Mm. They refused. So she remained pregnant into the third trimester whereupon she turned 18 and then then was able to sign the adoption papers on her own. Um, what a difficult thing to experience. Mm. Um, and so I think that's a lot, that's where a lot of Anna's wisdom comes from is having to assert independence from her family in a kind of uh, traumatic and brutal, but very necessary and self-affirming way so young. Um, and in having her life as she imagined it derailed so early on, and then for her to have to try to play catch up um, to that point without the support of her of her family, without a support system. So then from that moment on, she was also her only advocate. And I think that that just wisens you up. I also think that that's why she's very level. I, I see Anna as very um, level, even when she's having a massive emotional experience, she's very, um, she's close to herself because that's her best um, protection in the way that she's moved through the world. I also do think um, controversial hot take, younger people are smarter. We need to listen to them. Um, I think like it's, um, <laughs> you'd have to listen um, and then you'll be smarter. It's like, yes, there's a lot of like wisdom and and that comes through experience, comes through age, comes from history, yes. But there is equally important and vital to the evolution of moving on in our lives and growing as people and listening to the people who, who are coming after us um, generationally um, because we're so mired in the struggles of our own generation so that we could get things to the point that the younger generation comes in and then they are looking at a different landscape and they're gonna see different things and address different things, fix different things. Um, and 
we have to pay attention to that. And again, and again, and again, even if it's like, you know, that sounds crazy to me. Um, I mean, pronouns, we all have our pronouns on the screen. That's a really excellent example of that. It's like, you know, listen. Um, and so I think that's also partly why she's so wise is she went through this really massive experience and she's also 26. So mm -hmm. listen up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And I, I feel like I have more meaning behind now to the, the scene of, of when they each, when Matt and I ask each other, why are you alone? Um, and I, I love that extra context that you just gave us to that too. Um, okay, we have one more question from Dylan. Um, so Dylan's at saying uh, the use of color, particularly when Matt and Anna are in the nursery picking a paint color, which is one of my favorite scenes. And I love, by the way, that that's the poster for the film. Mm -hmm. um, it evoked a lot of meaning. Um, so can you speak to the choices behind some of the colors in the film? Oh, yes, um, I can. Uh, I love <laughs> I love color and I love um, design. I love working with costume designers and production designers and of course the DP and um, oh, cat chaos, I'm so sorry. Um, and so we had this green color that's in the script, the, the dusty blue green that they choose. And so I knew I wanted um, that to kind of be not like, super hitting the nail on the head or whatever, but to that to be the, the color of their two color stories combined. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt lives in a lot of um, like dark, um, like he has that dark forest teal uh, fleece he wears all the time. And he has the, these, the colors come up in his uh, apartment and in his clothes a lot. And then Anna has like this slight, slightly lighter, um, color palette and um, and yeah that they we bring bringing their blues and their greens together we get that blue green mm -hmm. um, and then we see it uh, we see that color in the restaurant in their first dinner together um, and um, it's in the nursery obviously that's what they choose and it's also in the hospital um, at the end and in the um, she's wearing like a similar color in the birthing class and so we were very mindful of like bring, bringing that through the story and then um at the baby shower which is um you know they're apart through so much of the baby shower um but they're both wearing that denim chambray uh that like kind of unites them even from afar and that they're the only people wearing uh, that particular color and that denim is like the the denim chambray is iconic and timeless um and so and so is their relationship um but it's being stretched and like pulled um in that in that party and, and tested so like those are ways that we um thought about the the color and we shot through vintage lenses um vintage super speed lenses i like to i love to shoot through uh old vintage glass so that was also had a huge um, hand in the way colors read um, on film and the way we lit them. We used a lot of diffusion and um, mm -hmm. again, going for a kind of time, timeless, um, warm uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting like a million cool, fun color things, but, <laughs> no, um, no. but yeah. It makes me want to watch it over again now too, just to <laughs> point all those things out. Well, okay, so so before we end, um, I do want to talk about the ending. You just brought that up um, again too, and i i want to I want to say that I think the one of the most beautiful things about this film is is the restraint, and I think there are so many moments where as a viewer, you might expect the film to go one way and it goes a totally different way. Um, and it, it tells an even more beautiful story going that way. Um, and I think a perfect example of that is the, is the last shot. Um, you know, the close up of Anna crying while Matt meets his baby for the first time. And we just get to be there with each of these characters that we've just learned to get to know over the last 90 minutes. And we get to imagine what they're both feeling in those moments without you having to explicitly show us that. Um, so I think that's just a huge testament to you as a writer and a director 
Um, and I, I just want to also thank you again. I'm promise I'm not trying to make you cry. <laughs> I think you just have such a faith in your audience, you know, to not spoon feed them a safe, worn out rom-com story. And, and yet you still deliver one that's so touching and memorable. Um, so, so thank you again um, for, for making such a beautiful film um, that you shared with us. And I, I think it's just the perfect way for us to kick off our festival this year, Nicole. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I am going to cry <laughs> when you live alone in quarantine and then you have these, like I'm with cats all day and then I talk to you and it's like serotonin, dopamine, like it going off my head, like my heart. So yes, thank you. This is the largest emotional experience I've had in a minute. So thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, um, I, I think that is all the time we have, unfortunately, for tonight. Thank you to everybody uh, who uh, submitted questions. Uh, thank you again to Nicole Beckwith for joining us tonight and for sharing this beautiful film with us. Um, I just want to say a special thanks to to Karen, again, our interpreter, and a big thank you to our audience for, for sharing this, this special night with us. We wouldn't be here without your ongoing support to bring film home. Uh, please consider contributing to our challenge match to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we're so grateful for any amount that you're able to give. To donate, please visit clevelandfilm.org slash donate. With that, please stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy the festival. <laughs>